Welcome to Over a Cup of Tea. Today joining us from Hawaii is Dr. Anna Marie Still. Dr. Still is an ethnomusicologist. We will explore the relationship between music and culture, music's intrinsic role in preserving historical memory and defining identity. Music builds bridges and it also blurs lines between divisions. We will see how all of these elements play a role in the South Asian context. Dr. Still specializes in South Asian and Himalayan region. She's an associate professor of South Asian studies at the University of Hawaii. In the past, she had postdoctoral positions at Oxford University and Leiden University. She is a graduate of Columbia University in New York City, where she also earned her doctorate. Anna has an active interest in relationship between music and religion, politics and public culture in South Asia and the Himalayan region. Along with teaching and researching on music, Anna is also a music performer. Her recent book is Singing Across Divide. Music and Intimate Politics in Nepal. In 2019, Anna's book won the Bernard Cohen Book Prize. Welcome to the show, Anna Marie. Thank you so much for hosting me on here. I'm very, very happy to be here with you today. Thank you. Uh, Anna, tell us how do emotions and language create music? I think that's a very interesting question because although both emotions and language are highly important ingredients in lots of music making, I think neither of them are absolutely necessary in order to make music. For example, if I just drum something off the top of my head, that would be music, but it may not be expressing any particular emotions of mine and it's also not using any language. So we have lots and lots of music that's not linguistically based, music that's not song. And we also have a lot of music that's not trying to express particular emotions. But then what happens is that music gets associated culturally with different emotions. And so that drumming pattern, whatever I chose, could be associated with an emotion. And to somebody who's in the know, they would know what it is. But to somebody else who is not in the know, it might just be an aesthetically pleasing pattern of rhythms. To many people, the Himalayas are a faraway mystical land. Tell us about the locale in which these indigenous people live. Um, so there are lots of Dandathi groups, Dandathi ethnic groups or indigenous ethnic groups in every locale all over Nepal. They make up at least 35% of the population. I think it's between 35 and 36 in the 2011 census. And they hold a majority in 27 out of the country's 75 districts at the time of that census. So there are indigenous peoples all throughout Nepal. And there, I know that there are 126 languages officially um, on the census books in Nepal. And depending on how you count them up, there are quite possibly more. 180 is another number that I've heard thrown around. So many, many of them are indigenous languages. And that just gives you a sense of the sheer numbers and also diversity of all the different groups that there are. So the groups that I have done research with are groups that live in the hills and mountain regions primarily. At least that's where their ancestral homes are. Now they've moved wherever they feel like living all over the country and outside of the country as well, of course. And the groups that I worked with primarily for the book on Dori singing, which we'll get to later, are the Gurung and Mogar and some Tamang indigenous ethnic groups. They come from the hill regions in the central area and then the western area of the country and a little bit over to the east as well. They've migrated. So, they're not in the highest snowy areas of the Himalayas. And frankly, nobody lives in the snowy areas year round. They'll go up there when it's not snowy and then they will migrate downhill um, when it's winter time. So do you think they're semi-nomadic? They're 
magic in their lifestyle. Uh, uh, I was just wondering, are they semi-nomadic in their lifestyle? Some are and some aren't. There are those traditions of what's called transhumance. So they'll take their herds of either buffalo or sheep, depending uh -huh. on the altitude, and also yaks at higher altitudes. They'll take mm -hmm. them up in the summertime. So they'll go uphill in the summertime. And then at the end of the summer, they'll come downhill again to the lower pastures where they winter. And there are festivals at each of those times when people decide to go up and then go down again. And they're called different names in different locales around the country. I see. And this is a difficult terrain. So when they are taking animals and the cattle along with them, um, is it a difficult climb for them? Is it a rigorous life uh, that they are leading? Yes, it's a quite rigorous life, for sure. Mm -hmm. OK. Lovely. It can also be a lonely life for the people who go up with the herds. And there are some people who end up spending their lives just taking their herds up in the high pastures. And some of those people are actually some of the country's uh, most revered folk musicians because they have all this time on their hands to develop their art. Oh, how lovely. I see. Uh, so you know, tell us about the customs of these indigenous people. And how do these customs shape the musical traditions or vice versa? And are there major differences between the Himalayan people uh, in different regions, like the ones that we see in Pakistan? Or have you ever visited the Himalayan peoples in Pakistan? I have never been to Pakistan, but I have heard about ethnic groups in Pakistan and what life is like in places like Chitral and other mm -hmm. um, mountainous regions of Pakistan and a difference that I think I could point out between this is a very very general difference now there are going to be many many other um, other differences major cultural differences but this general difference is also found between a lot of Nepal's indigenous groups and the dominant non-indigenous population which is a much more free attitude towards interaction between men and women who are not of the same family both pre-marital and after marriage. So young men and women are kind of expected to mix and mingle and do work in the fields together and even meet at designated locales, either someone's house in the village or somewhere nearby but outside the village for all night long singing and dancing gatherings. And these gatherings have also traditionally been a time when they plan um, group work parties so, and they also did handwork, like weaving blankets or um, making baskets or other things to use in agricultural and home life. So uh -huh. they're really um, woven into the labor and life and social relations and gender relations, especially of gurus and mothers who I worked with most closely. Oh, that's very interesting. So what you're telling us is that when they're weaving baskets or they're embroidering or they're doing all, all, any of those vocations, they also say, do, uh, is singing related to any of these traditions, you know, the regular way of life that they lead? Absolutely. Singing is closely related to all forms of labor in rural indigenous people's lives in Nepal. So I mentioned what people might do when they were sitting down and taking rest after a long day of work in the fields. But they mm -hmm. will also sing while working in the fields or going to the forest to collect firewood or collect fodder for their animals. And also what I mentioned before, taking their animals to the high pastures. Music is a huge part of all of those labor activities. That's very interesting. Uh, I know what um, I, I understand is that Music, um, people singing and people associating with music while working is probably a very South Asian um, way of life or have you seen this in other parts of the world too? I've definitely seen it in other parts of the world as well. Okay, wonderful. That's very interesting. Uh, tell us about the traditional Dori songs and the context in which they are sung. Yes, the Dori song. So Dori, you may know the word Doriauna, which is like repeat. And so that means 
something which is repeated, and in this case, repeated among two people or two groups of people, as often happens. So, what Thori is just um, poetically is two people or two groups of people improvising poetic couplets in song back and forth in a conversation. Oh, how interesting. And how often are Dori songs, Dori songs uh, sung, um, you know, in, in Nepal? Uh, like, they, they are, I read in your book that they are sung when people are working in the fields, but uh, are they also sung otherwise? They are sung when people are working in the fields and especially at festivals and fairs. So, like, religious melas or anything that's a cause for people to get together. I've seen gurungs have long funerals. The funerals will go for three days and nights. So and the people, the religious specialists, will be doing their ceremonies, but everybody who's participating in the funeral is not always concentrated on the ceremony. So when there's kind of a lull and it's nighttime, then they'll gather in groups or like around the side of the area, off to the side, but not where the major activity of the funeral is taking place because a funeral is something else that brings people together from far and wide. So now they've all come together to um, remember the deceased and they'll sing Dori songs. And the kind of Dori that gets sung is kind of age specific. So the thing that everybody is very interested in and latches onto is that among teenagers and people of um, marriageable age, the hoodie can actually be a way to find a marriage partner. And this is, it, it happens in a contest form. So two people may enter into a dhuri song and then in their improvised couplets, they'll kind of negotiate. Like, is this going to be a song where we sort of play for keeps? So we're competing with each other and then it depends on the different ethnic groups' traditions, how it will play out. So... In some of them, which are a bit more patriarchal, only the man can win the woman's hand in marriage. And if the woman wins, then she'll win the man's labor or like all of the alcohol that he's brought with him or something like that. But in other ethnic groups' traditions, if the woman wins the dori contest, she can also win the man's hand in marriage. And how you win traditionally is that you stump the other person. So you sing something which they cannot come up with an answer for. And if they go on for, you know, a, some sort of amount of time without being able to come up with an answer, then you've won. Oh, that's very interesting. So do you think that most people know poetry or the basics of poetry? Because they, if people are making songs extempore, they probably are very good poets too. Yes, and the Dori genres are poetic genres that are used in other contexts as well. So people are very aware of these kinds of poetry and can come up with couplets. And even if they don't sing Dori, even if they're not singers, they may make up these kinds of couplets extempore just in talking with other members of their household or their friends just for fun. Okay, all right. So this seems like a very literate society and in its own context or, you know, and in a non-academic context, uh, it could be termed a very literary society where people can produce poetry. Absolutely, and I think that's a wonderful point because even if they're not literate in terms of having a great grasp of the poetry which is written, they have an incredible tradition of oral literature. And that goes far beyond Dori. Dori is very simple and fun and light. You can express deep truths with it, but because maybe you want to sing for a whole entire night, all the couplets that you make up are not going to be expressing deep truth. Like a lot of them are just very, very light and often silly even. Hmm. So you get a lot of practice when you do it quite a bit. And some people are incredible poets. I should mention um, one who's known as one of Nepal's foremost folk poets is Ali Mia. And Ali Mia lived in the middle of the 20th century, and he just passed away about a decade or 15 years ago, maybe now. And 
he is one of those people who, although he was never recorded as a singer, many people wrote down what he's saying because what he made up was just so poetically deep and witty. Oh, how, how lovely. You know, it reminds me of the Japanese haiku poetry, how haiku is created. But, and uh, so they are not um, um, rhythms um, in, the, in the couplets all the time. But they do have a lot of meaning, but simple words and uh, uh, created very um, simply, um, but it creates a lot of meaning. Yes, and it follows a particular poetic meter. So you have to follow the rules of meter and rhyme. So when people are doing that, then that's another way in which they're incred incredibly literate and artistically rich. That's lovely. That's very nice to know. So Nepal at one point in time used these indigenous songs to build a national narrative. Do you think such interventions are artificial and harm the arts in general? Um, just to clarify, Nepal used folk music extensively to build a national narrative, and among them are indigenous songs, but they oh. also relied on a sort of more urban art song genre called Adumiki, and that draws on folk music as well, but it mixes it with a whole lot of other stuff. And so, mm -hmm. although indigenous folk music is included, it's not the full extent of everything that people have done in Nepal from the nationalist um, perspective. And okay. also, Dohori too, like the practice of Dohori singing is closely associated with indigenous ethnic groups, but it's not only indigenous, indigenous ethnic groups who do it. And okay. so you can find people singing in other languages who are not of these Janjati groups, like Postpuri speakers, for example, Maitili speakers, Hindi speakers, in the plains of Nepal. They also do it in their own languages, which I didn't study because I don't speak them as well. Right. Okay. So about the question regarding nationalism and if it's artificial, it's definitely an intervention and it definitely changes things. So whether it's um, across the board a bad thing is hard to say. I can see good things that have come of it. They've definitely promoted and um, encouraged innovation in multiple forms of folk music. And what I've looked at regarding the sort of bad sides is that some things always fall by the wayside. So when one genre is chosen as nationally representative, no matter how broad that genre might be, there's always something that's going to get um, ignored and maybe even suppressed. So I've looked at that a little bit regarding genres that are in languages other than Nepali and how they don't get represented as nationally representative, even if they're very, very close to the center of the Nepali nation in other historical ways. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, tell us about, you know, music is part of one's identity. And um, ethnic music is definitely part of one's identity. How important is it to, pre to preserve musical traditions uh, as part of saving heritage? I think it's extremely important to uh, work on preservation as preservation of living traditions. So uh, museumizing traditions is not really a goal, I think, okay. that is good to be pursuing. I think that while preserving archival recordings and archival instruments and preserving history is extremely important for all of us to be able to connect with our pasts, if we're talking about preserving music, then I think that our emphasis should be on playing it, performing it, um, innovating in new ways based on the tradition, and finding ways to keep it living and vibrant and alive. I see. So you think that it has to be evolved. Music has to be evolved um, to, to stay alive. I think that it's inevitable that it will evolve. Okay. All right. Yes, sure. So, uh, do you think geography plays a role in creating music? And uh, not just culture, but even geography is part of a musical heritage? I think that it can be. It's not... It's not an absolutely necessary ingredient, but um, the historical connections that we make between music and place are extremely important. 
And so there's that aspect of it. But if you mean in a little bit more of a um, material way, I can give you an example of how geography is important in some Nepali folk music, which is that in places that have hills that are very close to each other, people will use those hills and the echoes coming off of those hills to create a desired um, amplified echoing sound. And then when they get to some place that's not in those hills, like say they move to the city, then they try to recreate that very sound electronically in a recording studio. So that aspect of geography is inherent to the musical sound that they want to make in order to um, evoke that hill setting. Oh, lovely. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Anna, you have studied South Asian music and you have taken lessons in uh, South Asian classical music. And of course, you are an accomplished performer. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about the complexity of the ragas of the South Asian music. Yes, the raga music is. Um infinitely complex and while I have studied it for sure my performance accomplishments are very much more in folk music of Nepal and western music. Um, I think that my studies of raga music have given me a greater appreciation of just how absolutely vast and complex and interesting, infinitely interesting the whole tradition is. I wouldn't say I'm an accomplished performer of it though. I'm very much a student still. Oh, you, oh you, you're very humble. Um, I, I just wanted to know, uh, do you think the classical music uh, and, and the subcontinent that is based on, you know, people say on the compound mathematical formulas, um, do, do you think the folk music is as complex as, as the classical music is, although it looks very simple from outside? Um, yes, and it depends. So, some of the classical music, like in Carnatic classical, you can get something, some tal that you are dividing into 13 and a half matras. So in folk music, you may find 10 matras, but you're not going to find, at least in Nepali folk music that I'm familiar with, I have mm -hmm. never found anything like 13 and a half. So yeah, 7, 10, um, things divisible by 2 and 3, those are all very much found in folk music. But I think that um, especially the southern subcontinent traditions has developed the mathematical complexities to a very high degree. In folk music, the poetic meter and um, putting words together in a way that fits the poetic and musical meters is an art that you don't find extemporaneously in classical music to the same degree. So that's something that, at least in Nepali folk music, is a bit more highly developed than um, the way that it's done in, folk, in classical, I believe. In classical, you do different things with the words. Like you may take the first line of a stai, and then you might do bolbanao pans using that, which is a different way of dividing up words in relation to rhythm. But in Nepali dori singing and most of the folk genres where you make up verses extempore, then you need to be able to do that in full sentences and still fit it in to the meter. So it's a totally different skill. And oh also my, highly interesting. Uh, do you think with the, the performing arts are affected when they have a shrinking space in the society? Oh, very much so. And I was wondering if that's a... Um, pre-corona or post-corona question, because the way that space is shrinking is um, very different nowadays. And we see a lot more mediated performances, but the joy of being in one place with the performers is uh, greatly diminished. And I think that's a very, very challenging thing for performers and music lovers alike. Yes, I can understand. How about the folk music? How much the folk music is affected by the modern world? Um, with modernity now reaching even small villages, uh, folk traditions are diminishing. Uh, how much the folk music is affected? I think it's affected to varying degrees, depending on a lot of factors. Um, I see a lot of innovations and 
fusions happening that are actually very interesting. And some of them are more surface and others of them are deeper. What I might call more surface is if you keep the same sort of poetic meter and melodic and rhythmic style, and you add on different instruments or different sort of solos, in, instrumental solos in between a vocal um, declamation of a verse. Then that's um, sort of a surface change. But if you restructure a whole entire song or a whole entire dance, then that's um, a much deeper change. And I see both of those things going on. Both of them are interesting. They're happening in tons of different ways. So I would say this is one way that folk music is actually being staying alive and evolving. So there, this is a good side. And I firmly believe in it, even if I don't prefer everybody's changes that they're making. I think in general, this is a very good sign. I think that um, in, in as, as far as bad sides go, one of the bad sides is um, a turn to more technological consumption rather than making things oneself. So I think engaging musically, it's a skill that everybody can learn and when you get things coming to you on your mobile phone that are just so absolutely produced, mm -hmm. it seems a bit challenging. And it seems like, even though, you know, this is supposed to be folk music, but it's recorded in an urban studio and it's got this hip hop influenced music video, like, is this what we're supposed to do? Oh, we'll leave that to the professionals. Oh. And you know, like that's the kind of attitude that I hope people don't develop. Yes, I see traditions that are dying out. Um, they're dying out in some places and not in others. So that is hard to tell um, what's going on. And it's hard to make judgments about. For example, there's a dance form called Maruni, which has died out um, to a large extent in the ways that it used to be danced in Western Nepal. In Darjeeling, it is <laughs> flourishing. It is absolutely okay. flourishing. And okay. I've talked to some people in Western Nepal, and they say it's coming back because we value this stuff. It makes us unique. So I think that people are coming to see that they have their own unique things that they should keep on doing, or at um, least um, base their own innovative new creations on. Well, that, that's very nice to know. Um, before we end, Anna, please tell us about your next project. Uh, your book did so well, and it's a defining book on Uhuri songs. Um, what do you have in store for us? The next project, well, the project after the Dohuri book has been to document the history of leftist political song in Nepal. So I've focused on song and dance. It's often bound up with theater as well. There's a great book that's just come out from a theater perspective. And so uh, I'm really focusing on the song and dance, going back to about the 1950s up to the present day. And I've made one film about a people singer named Kusiram Pakrin. Um, my colleague, Bhakta Siangten in Nepal, and I finished this film um, at the end of 2019, and we've shown it in a couple of festivals. Oh, how lovely. Okay, so th that's very interesting to know. Uh, thank you so much, Anna. Thank you for your time, and this was a brilliant discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Anna Stur and her brilliant insight into music of the Himalayas.